It's been said that the beauty of baseball is that every spring, like the season itself, life begins anew. For a baseball team and its followers, spring brings a new season, a new chance, a new beginning. Since they joined the National League in 1890, the Dodgers of both Brooklyn and Los Angeles have been a part of that wonderful cycle. For the past 100 springs, as each season awoke, so too did the hope and passion of the Dodgers and their fans. Over the past century, it's been that hope and passion that has helped tie generations of Dodger fans together. Passions for greats like Babe Herman and the boys of summer and the men of 88. Passion for coming out to spend a summer's day rooting for their team in a tiny ballpark in the Flatbush section of Brooklyn or a spacious one in Los Angeles. Passion for listening to a couple of redheads by the name of Barber and Scully paint a picture of words when they couldn't be there. Passion for the winners and yes, even passion for the losers. For as we read in The Boys of Summer, you may glory in a team triumphant, but you fall in love with a team in defeat. That's the way it's been for the Dodgers and their fans, a 100-year romance that's held up through the good times and the bad. In the beginning, they came from across the sea, knowing little or nothing about our culture. From places like Palermo and Oslo and Dublin, they came to start a new life. Soon these immigrants became Americans and like most Americans, they came to love baseball, especially in Brooklyn. And then later on in Los Angeles too. For them, the Dodgers were a unifying force. 100 years is a long time. A lot has happened since 1890 and in many ways, the Dodgers have even been a mirror of the time. It is, in fact, hard to imagine what baseball would have been like without the Dodgers, a team whose folklore has been celebrated in song and film and art and literature more than twice as much as any, any other. Through the decades, the Dodgers' rich history and tradition has provided a backbone for our national pastime and a fascinating story for and of our time. History tells us that story actually began in 1849, when baseball was first played in Brooklyn. The early clubs were amateurs, but their very existence eventually led to the formation of Brooklyn's first professional team. The Brooklyn Dodgers came about in the early 1880s. Uh, two men by the name of Byrne and Doyle were the owners. And in 1883, they hired a young man to sell peanuts and scorecards. His name was Charlie Ebbets, and they played in the American Association until the final year, 1889, when they won the pennant, 
And then the following year, 1890, they joined the National League. And they won the pennant in 1890. And that's the only time in baseball history that one ball club won two pennants in two different leagues. Of course, they did it back to back. The name Dodgers came from a shortened version of Trolley Dodgers, a disparaging term Manhattanites used to describe the people of Brooklyn. Although they would also sometimes be called the Bridegrooms, the Superbas, and the Robins, Dodgers was the name that stuck. What didn't stick, however, was the team's first manager, Bill McGonigal, who was fired after winning the pennant in 1890. Soon after, the winning would not come as easy, but that didn't discourage the fans, who by decade's end regularly filled Washington Park, a wooden stadium which had become the team's home in 1898. The arrival of Ned Hanlon from Baltimore in 1899 saw the Brooks' fortunes mirror their steady rise in popularity. Led by Joe Kelly and, and several of Hanlon's other ex-Baltimore stars, like Hall of Famer Wee Willie Keeler, Brooklyn won two pennants in Hanlon's first two seasons. But soon, Hanlon would lose his magic, and Brooklyn would go on to struggle for the next decade and a half. There were, however, some bright spots, like having the National League's most valuable player, Jake Dalbert, who won the Chalmers Award in 1912. But the biggest news came on April 9, 1913, when Charlie Ebbets, who by now had gained control of the club, unveiled a 25,000-seat concrete stadium he modestly named Abbott's Field. A year later, Abbott's hired manager Wilbert Robinson, and Uncle Robbie, as he was affectionately known, would go on to manage the Dodgers for 16 seasons. Robbie's career overlapped those of several Dodger greats, like pitcher Knapp Rucker and Hall of Famer Zach Wheat who Brant Rickey would later claim was the best outfielder the Dodgers ever had. But as good as Wheat was, Dodger fans still favored a fiery outfielder by the name of Casey Stengel. Led by Wheat's talent and Stengel's heart, Robbie's Dodgers made it to their first World Series in 1916, where they lost to pitcher Babe Ruth and the Red Sox in five games. Four years later, in 1920, the Dodgers made it back to the series. This time, despite the legendary spitball of Burley Grimes, the Dodgers lost to the Cleveland Indians in a series which is now remembered for the Dodgers' Clarence Mitchell hitting into the only unassisted triple play in series history. The rest of the Roaring Twenties were anything but for the Dodgers. The people of Brooklyn were out enjoying their newfound prosperity in places like Coney Island. The Dodgers suffered through their darkest years yet. The low point came in the middle of the decade with the sudden death of Ebbets. A week later, after catching a cold at Ebbets' funeral, co-owner Ed McKeever would die too, leaving the club to his brother Steve. Under Steve McKeever's leadership, the Dodgers did have a few stars like pitcher Dazzy Vance, who some say was the Sandy Koufax of his day. But the rest of the team, however, was made up of players like Harry Rakonda, Rube Bressler, Jigger Stats, and Johnny Gooch. These were not exactly household names. Because we were a seventh and eighth place club in 27 and 28, outside of our pitching, our players were not what you might call stars. They were all players who hit between 250 and 280 outside of Babe Hyman, who was a genuinely good 330, 340 hitter. Babe Herman really was the exception, yet he still became better known for his supposed bonehead plays than his hitting ability. In actuality, Herman's undeserved reputation was just a product of the times, and he the unwilling symbol of a team which had come to be known as the Daffiness Boys. In those days, you got to realize that the Dodgers were the poor club of New York. They had the Giants with McGraw there, and the Yankees with Babe Ruth and those guys. So we were naturally the, the poor club in, in New York, and they made fun of us. With good reason. In the early part of the 1930s, the Dodgers sailed along in the second division with a record that was about as poor as the rest of the country. 
Uncle Robbie had left after the 31 season, and in 1934, the team hired Casey Stengel to manage. I'm going through these workouts in pretty good shape. Well, uh, I understand that we have the best training camp in Florida as far as the grounds are concerned. This infield is in great shape. Uh, the boys take pleasure in uh, performing on it. Pleasure, maybe, but success? Not exactly. And even when someone like Van Lingle Mungo excelled, fans just made fun of the pitcher's name instead. All the while, Brooklyn persevered. If those Manhattanites across the river insisted on ridiculing their team, then why shouldn't Dodger fans have some fun with them too? At least that's what cartoonist Willard Mullen had in mind when he created the Brooklyn Bum. Through the years, Mullen's bum became the team's endearing and long-lasting symbol of futility and wound up tugging at the heartstrings of an entire nation. Fans, however, will only take so much losing. And as the 30s neared an end, the Dodgers were nearly bankrupt. Change, though, would come with the arrival of general manager Larry McPhail. McPhail's job would ultimately be to revamp the club on the field. But at first, he wasn't above bringing in an aging Babe Ruth as a coach to help sell tickets. McPhail really understood the value of promotion. And to that end, he also hired the first voice of the Dodgers, Red Barber. But first and foremost, McPhail knew his baseball. And his smartest move came in 1939 when he named Leo DeRocher as the Dodgers manager, although the two didn't always see eye to eye. You were in trouble with McPhail every day. He fired me 60 times. Told McPhail, I got a guy can play shortstop. Balls are going by me this far. I can't get to him anymore. I said, but I got a kid here. It looks like he's 12 years old. But if I polish him up, He's a diamond in the rough, and he is some player. He says, you play him and you're fired. Well, I said, I'm going to play him. You're fired. Next day, I came out, put the uniform on, put Reese in the lineup. Been in the lineup ever since. That was how the Dodgers began their first decade of excellence in quite some time. In 1941, their lineup also included the league's MVP, Dolph Camilli, and Pete Reeser, who would win the batting title. Once again, the team's popularity was growing, and with the people's church, Dixie Walker, leading the way, the Dodgers won 100 games for the first time in their history, and with it, a National League pennant that sent Brooklyn into a frenzy. Conquering heroes, returning to Brooklyn with the first National League championship that Flatbush has seen in 21 years. And what may have been an orderly and elaborately planned reception soon crashes all parade lines when enthusiasm goes out of bounds and Brooklyn takes over her beloved Dodgers and the keynote becomes Bedlam. Yes, sir, the Brooks are in. After one of the bitterest and most spectacular pennant struggles the old pastime has ever known. And regardless of what may happen in that four out of seven World Series fight, Brooklyn's Dodgers out here today are the men of the hour and the salt of the earth. It's been lots of fun winning, and I hope that we'll win the World Series and satisfy these rabid Brooklyn fans. It's a great fight, and I got a great bunch of fellas, and they showed me that they had the right stuff to play the way they did all summer long. Summer, however, always turns to fall, and for the Dodgers, fall meant the New York Yankees. The 1941 series was the first meeting between the two bid arrivals and is best remembered for catcher Mickey Owens' famous pass ball with two out in the ninth inning of game four. The Dodgers would lose the series, and although no one really could have sensed it, Owens' error would only be the first of many tortuous moments Dodger fans would suffer at the hands of the Yankees. The next year, the Dodgers were eager to repeat, and although they won 104 games, they still fell short of the Cardinals. After the season, the Dodgers surprisingly made a change in the front office. Despite the team's outstanding record the two previous years, Larry McPhail was forced to resign, passing on the job of general manager to Branch Rickey. Right from the start, Rickey did an exceptional job. His head was filled with revolutionary ideas, in addition, 
Under his watchful eye, the Dodgers quietly stockpiled an enormous amount of talent during the war years. Although from the product they put on the, on the field, you wouldn't have known it. How about your civ infield? I got one here. Come on! Oh, those big hops. You always get those big hops. Oh, now look, you haven't got a bucket of paint with you on third base, you know. You've got to get the paintbrush out of your hand. Do your best now. This is for the movies. How's that? Didn't you get that? It was a dandy if it had stuck in your glove. When the war ended, the Dodgers unleashed some of that stockpile talent, and in 1946, they lost to the Cardinals in the first playoff in National League history. That year would also be the beginning of the end for DeRocher, who would be suspended from baseball for allegedly associating with gamblers at the beginning of the 47 season. Baseball in Brooklyn really began to define itself during the late 40s. The war was over, and the fans streamed into Ebbets Field in record numbers. There, they didn't just cheer for the Dodgers. They also lived, loved, and died for the Dodgers. The players were, in a way, the adopted children of an immigrant-filled borough with an ethnic makeup so diversified that baseball, especially Dodger baseball, came to be the one thing all Brooklynites could agree on. The people of Brooklyn certainly had other ways to occupy their time, but to them, nothing could compare with a day that was spent watching or listening to the Dodgers. The Dodgers were Brooklyn's team, and no other was ever idolized by their fans as deeply and fervently as they were. Hey, did you see what happened yesterday? We was playing St. Louis and a three all going into the tight end. When they feed Dixie Walker, fast one. On the inside. 400 feet, Dixie hit that one. 400 feet. And the umpire calls it a foul ball. Ebbets Field was the most intimate ballpark uh, in the big leagues. It was uh, extremely small. Uh, when you um, sat in a box seat at Ebbets Field, uh, you could hear the players, you could see the bridge of perspiration on their faces. Uh, you were right in there with it. They were right on top of you in that little field, you know, and man, we were their heroes. The fans used to talk to us in and out of the dugout on the field. You'd hear the fans behind the dugout and in the close box seats. The talk wasn't always complimentary if you were having a bad day. <laughs> and the fans, it was like a love affair. You know, you can say some pretty strong things to somebody you love that you wouldn't say to just a stranger. Ice can, what are you doing? Trying a game. The smallness of Ebbets Field and the intensity of the Brooklyn fans made it possible uh, for a certain Brooklyn rooters to stand out. We had Hilda Chester, who was a leather-lunged woman who became a Dodger fan late in life, and she sat in the bleachers in center field, which in those days, the bleachers was the upper deck in center field, and Hilda had leather lungs. I mean, you could hear Hilda in the dugout, and she'd say, Hey, Branca, look at me when I talk, talk to you. And she'd do that to everybody, and she'd get, she was good, though. she was fun. You had the Brooklyn Dodgers Symphony. Uh, I named them the Symphony. Uh, they couldn't play a note. They couldn't read a note. The thing that they had more than anything else was their bass drum. And they used to wait for the opposition. When someone struck out or made an out and started walking back, it got to be a little game. So they'd go, da -da 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 and they'd wait. And the fellow would start walking around, he'd go to sit down, nope, he wouldn't sit down. He'd go take a drink of water, he'd go back to sit down, no, he wouldn't sit down. But the, the Brooklyn Dodgers Symphony, they never missed him. When he did finally sit on the dugout, bang, they sat him down. 
When you walked down the street in Brooklyn, you didn't need a radio because everybody had the game tuned on and was listening to Red Barber. Kevin Higby, the strong arm right hander, is DeRoche's choice this afternoon in another one of these tough tussles in baseball's bitterest rivalry, the New York Giants over at Ebbets Field. Higby, right hander, wears number 13, comes down on the outside for ball one. Radio was dominant. And of course, you could go any place in Brooklyn, but you couldn't get out of the sound of a ball game. His next one's right through there for a call second strike. People had the radios on. Uh, portables on the beach at, at Coney Island. Uh, so you could not get out of the sound of the Brooklyn broadcast. And it's swung on and missed for strike three, and it's another K in the scorebook. Higby, right-hander, where's number 13? Just one more run, that's all they needed. And they had it on third base. It's the most terrible thing I ever heard of. Well, they can still win the next one. They gotta win. They gotta! Winning without the suspended DeRozier would prove to be routine for Ricky's Dodgers in 47. That spring, he hired Bert Schotten to replace Leo. And despite his unusual way of dressing, Schotten kept the Dodgers on a winning track. Of course, the arrival of Jackie Robinson helped a great deal. As the Major League's first black ball player of the modern era, Jackie had come to the Dodgers at the beginning of the 47 season and brought with him an aggressive brand of play that saw him win baseball's first Rookie of the Year award. Brooklyn fans embraced Robinson for what he stood for and the manner in which he went about showing it. His determination and skill helped the Dodgers to win their first pennant since 41, and that led to another chance in the World Series and another crack at the New York Yankees. The 47 series would be the first of six times the Yanks and Dodgers would face each other over the next 10 years. It went the full seven games and to this day is best remembered for two two plays that both went the Dodgers way. The first came in the fourth game when Yankee pitcher Bill Bevin's attempt at the first ever series no hitter fell apart with two out in the bottom of the ninth. The result of Cookie Labagetto's remarkable pinch hit. The pitch. Swung on, there's a drive hit out toward the right field corner. Henrik is going back. He can't get it. It's off the wall for a base hit. Here comes the tying run, and here comes the winning run. The second came in game six, when Al Gianfrido made one of the most famous catches in series history. Here's the pitch. Swung on, belted. It's a long one, deep in the left center. Back for Gianfrido. Back, 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 back. He makes a one-handed catch against the bullpen. Despite the twin heroics, the Dodgers still lost the series, falling 5-2 in the finale. Nineteen forty-seven. History tells us that in the one hundred years of Dodger baseball, nineteen forty-seven had the most profound impact on not only the game but America as well. It was the year Jackie Robinson became a Brooklyn Dodger, overcoming and overlooking a tremendous amount of ugly discrimination and persecution along the way. I do not recall an occasion when Jack said to me or I said to him, let's give it up. It's too much. It's taking too much out of us. We're paying too high a price. We were in this for others as well as for ourselves. I mean, we, just, we were just instruments. And we couldn't afford to give up. The Brooklyn fan is eternally hopeful. He wants this ball player to do well so the Dodgers can do well. And if Robinson could do well, that was just fine. And once Robinson demonstrated his ability, and once he started dancing down off first base, and my goodness, Evans Field went wild. He was drawing into baseball fans by the millions. I mean, spring training, if we played any club, I can guarantee that we had to have ground rules because the fans would be overflowing into the outfield. But it's a natural fact when Jackie comes what to What a pass. competitor Jackie was. Sam Jones threw at him and hit him. 
he got on first base and he told Sam Jones, I must steal second. He did. Told him he was gonna steal third. And he did. And he stole home and beat him one he won nothing. Jackie Robinson's 10-year Dodger career was marked with awards and accolades, and because he was so spectacular on the field and so much a gentleman off it, his legacy lives on to this day. It went well beyond baseball. They saw him in a baseball arena, but they really appreciated who he was beyond baseball. When I got a chance to come here, man, it was like, uh, this was Jackie's home. I'm in his house now. I'm sitting at his table. And I got to live up to some expectations. He has made some plans for us. He has walked and he's done things for us. And I'm going to respect that no matter what. And that's what Jackie meant to me. I am very proud that I played with Jackie Robson. Very proud. Along with the arrival of Robinson, the late 40s and early 50s saw a change come in other ways, too. In 1948, the Dodgers turned a naval air station in Vero Beach, Florida, into Dodger Town, which to this day remains the organization's model spring training home. Around the same time, television also played a role in the changing face of Brooklyn Dodger baseball. By the beginning of the decade, the Dodgers were New York's number one attraction over the airwaves. So much so that even a TV star could become as well known as the Dodger players. Happy Felton and his not whole gang, direct from Ebbets Field in Brooklyn. See our idea here? We bring in the kids to meet the stars of the baseball diamond. They're heroes. They come in and meet them or try it out with them. Catch on? Now let's go on out there. Run out in the outfield. I'll tell you what we do. I knock a couple on the ground to him, will you, Duke, please? And Here we go. Bill Bambolo. Staten Island. Whoop. Okay. New Dorp High School. Thank you. Thank Duke. Thank the rest of them here. All right. Thank you, boys. Let's get them today, huh? Thank you, Tommy. Thank you, Duke. Fine. There's your man waiting for you down here. I think the reason he picked uh, Gene Hermansky to talk to is because he's from Jersey. Is that right? Right. Well, well, listen, I want you to explain to me about that giant uniform. What's well, the idea? See, it's like this. We don't get our pick over and everything. Then we just get a uniform, oh, see? Oh, well, you're forgiving you're, they haven't, In Brooklyn's place, they haven't got no Dodger on uniform at all. They just got the cards, the Cubs, and the Giants. Oh, oh we'll have right. to take care of that. Okay. Now, what do you want to We have? hope you enjoy it. In the meantime, I'll be seeing you pretty good. Anytime you want something right, try a baby root. Goodbye now. On the field, the Burt Schotten-led Dodgers found themselves well on their way towards becoming the National League's most dominant team. In 1949, Brooklyn outlasted the rival St. Louis Cardinals by a single game, although the Dodgers' happiness would soon end in a five-game World Series loss to the Yankees. 49 would turn out to be the first of three straight seasons with down-to-the-wire pennant races. The Dodgers were playing exciting baseball, led by several new stars, like Roy Campanella, who had become the team's starting catcher in 1948. Campanella's arrival also enabled the Dodgers to move Gil Hodges out from behind the plate to first base. Hodges turned out to be a pillar of strength at his new position, knocking in more than 100 runs seven seasons in a row, beginning in 1949. Campy and Hodges were joined by the scoonge Carl Ferrillo, slick fielding third baseman Billy Cox, veteran outfielder Andy Pathko, and a young but talented Duke Snyder to form the most powerful lineup in the league. By 1951, that lineup was managed by Charlie Dressen, who had replaced Shotton shortly after Walter O'Malley had gained control of the team from Branch Rickey. Hiring Dressen turned out to be a brilliant move, at least at first. With Charlie at the helm, the Dodgers raced out to a big lead in August over the second-place Giants. Then, everything fell apart. The Giants came from way back to force the legendary playoff of 1951. Three games, which can now be whittled down to five immortal words by Russ Hodges. A single swing of the bat by Bobby Thompson and one Ralph Branca pitch. Bobby Thompson takes a strike call on the inside corner. People forget that Ralph Branca 
not only relieved on Sunday, he also relieved Saturday, relieved Sunday, pitched two innings, pitched Monday and went eight innings, had Tuesday off, and I was back in the bullpen to pitch on Wednesday. His call also made it famous. still only a game, and it's still only one day of your life. It's one year of your life. I mean, we should have won the pennant, and we didn't. Given the shock of 1951, the Dodgers might just have faded away. But players like Roy Campanella would never have let that happen. Campy was a sweet man, but put him on a baseball field, and nobody played with more intensity or received as much respect from his teammates. He won his first MVP award in 51, followed that with two more in 53 and 55, as much a result of his play behind the plate than at it. All I tried to do was think, what's Campanella thinking? When he'd give me a pitch, I, I'd just say, well, what is he calling for this pitch for? And he's, he's got something in mind, you know. I just tried to think with old Roy, and sometimes he'd call for a pitch. It would frankly scare me to death, but I'd trust him. I'd say, okay, here it goes. I didn't have to shake my head to Roy. Uh, I shook him off three times. As I recall my career, and the, the, the three times I did, they were home runs. Home runs for the Dodgers usually came from Duke Snyder. He had a beautiful, powerful swing, and he played baseball with a reckless abandon that showed a true love for the game and his teammates. To be a part of that team was uh, just a wonderful gift to me because uh, uh, we had a phenomenal bunch of men playing on that team. And I use the word team, and I mean the word team, because uh, everybody just signed their contract, went to spring training, and, and got in shape to beat somebody. And most of the time, we did. Except when the Dodgers played the Yankees, the corporate Yankees, the well-to-do Yankees. Every Brooklyn fan hated them for what they were and what they stood for. In both 52 and 53, the Dodgers made it to the series again, but lost to the Yanks for the fifth time since 1941. It was torture. After the two consecutive series disappointments, O'Malley decided to replace Dressen with Walter Alston. As a rookie manager taking over a veteran club, Alston's position was tenuous, especially when the Dodgers struggled in 54. But the next year was different. Alston began to win over the Dodgers' trust, and the team responded by getting off to a great start. As usual, one of the reasons was the steady and reliable play of Pee Wee Reese. The Dodger captain had been with the team since 1940, and now in the twilight of his career, he was still the glue which kept the boys of summer together. Another was the pitching of Don Newcomb, who had joined the team a year before in 1954. Newcomb won 20 games in 55 and gave the Dodgers something they would need in October, another strong arm to challenge the Yanks. But 55 started out looking like any other series, with the Yanks winning the first two at home. Back at Ebbets Field, the Dodgers won all three. For the third time since 1947, they were one win away. The Yankees, however, set up a seventh game, and for the finale, Alston selected rookie pitcher Johnny Padres. It was a gamble, but the Dodgers responded by taking a two to nothing lead. Then Alston inserted Sandy Amaros in left field just before the bottom of the sixth. At the time, the move went virtually unnoticed. But when Yogi Berra came up with the tying runs on first and second, it saved the game. When Berra hit the ball, I'm in trouble. I see the flight of the ball and it kept slicing. I see, is he going to get to it? And when Sandy stuck his hand out, I see the ball go in his glove and he made a great relay throw to Pee Wee. And he saw the base runners all running and never hesitated and threw a perfect strike to Gill. The Dodgers had finally gotten the break they needed, and Padres, for one, wasn't going to let the opportunity get away. 
It seemed like everybody in Yankee Stadium was just standing up and giving me an ovation. And I said to myself, boy, I can't let this game get away from me now. For Brooklyn fans, waiting for the last nine outs seemed endless. It wasn't a matter of how it would go wrong, but when. Only this time it didn't. The Brooklyn Dodgers were world champions. I didn't go jump on anybody's back or anything like that. I went right straight into the clubhouse. I just sat there. A lot of the guys sat in their lockers. Robinson sat down in front of his locker and, and Hodges. And uh, I think it was a time just to contemplate what a fantastic feeling after all those frustrating years. And I think we all sort of looked at each other and says, hey, we finally did it. And once it, once it, it sunk in that we were world's champions, why well, then we just let it go. Johnny brought the crown to Ebbets Field at last. No more wait till next year. Now next year is past. Casey's mighty men struck out. You could hear all Brooklyn shout. Johnny Padres has a halo around his head. I could kiss him. Johnny Padres has a halo around his head. Pinch me, I'm dreaming. These were the best of times for the boys of summer. They had reached the pinnacle. Throughout the mid-50s, the Dodgers really were one big happy family. And like most other families, they too took home movies. In this case, courtesy of Carl Erskine. Hi, this is the original clubhouse at Vero Beach at Dodger Town. The captain leads us off for our morning practice. Jackie had a little weight problem in the spring. That's why he's wearing that heavy jacket. Well, those sprints, breaks, and leads, uh, speed, always big at the Dodger camp. Well, Campy always had a little weight problem, too, and Cam this was Dressen's uh, exercise to take the, what Campy said was muscle off around his middle. Well, we worked hard in training, but uh, uh, we still had lots of fun, too. We had a bunch of great guys. You know, I don't think I ever saw Labine use this in the game. There's my roomie, the Duke. Boy, what a great guy. Jackie and Pee Wee, classic double play combination. Practiced over and over and over again. That's Rocky Bridges sitting on the bag. Diamond number two, Dodger Town. Dottie, Pee Wee, and little Barbie. Beautiful family. Of course, the wives always added a great deal at Dodger Town around the pool. And Campy on his boat, the Princess, named after his daughter. This was at the peak of Roy's career. I tell you, he had everything in the world going for him. A fantastic man. Well, we had a lot of great times, and this is sort of my look back on those great Dodger years. Success has a way of spoiling things, but not in Brooklyn, at least not in 1956. The Dodgers followed their first world championship with another pennant and another trip to the World Series. This time, however, the Yankees beat them in yet another seven-game series. By now, many of the boys of summer were in the autumn of their careers, including Jackie Robinson, who chose to retire rather than accept a trade to the Giants just before the 57 season. If Robinson's departure signaled the unraveling of an era, what happened a season later would mark its end. For a few years now, there had been rumblings about the Dodgers leaving Brooklyn, or at least in Ebbets Field, that everyone acknowledged was becoming too small and antiquated. Then, too, Brooklyn itself was going through rough times, with both businesses and people leaving the borough. In 1958, it all came to a head. I think in some ways the, the problem was the area around Ebbets Field was holding constant. It wasn't changing while everything else was. The people were going to Long Island. They were moving to Westchester and Connecticut, and they were moving to New Jersey. 
and of course after the Second World War with the construction of highways and the building of suburbs and such, uh, many, many more people owned cars and relied on that for transportation. And this old neighborhood ballpark in this old part of Brooklyn simply wasn't able to accommodate that kind of, uh, of, of traffic, that kind of market. That's precisely why the site at Atlantic and Flatbush uh, did have appeal. What will it take to keep the Dodgers in Brooklyn? Uh, we've been fighting for a new stadium at the Atlantic and Flatbush Avenue site. We've offered to invest over $5 million. Uh, in if Walter O'Malley had gotten his way, that stadium at Atlantic and Flatbush would have been a domed stadium that Buckminster Fuller had designed. That goes over the top, which gives it the protection uh, that it should have. In other words, people could see football games, baseball games, prize fights, or go to conventions in any kind of weather because they would be protected. O'Malley's visionary idea would later become the model for the Astrodome. It would not, however, become the Dodgers' new home. Ultimately, the team would leave Brooklyn and head west for the 58 season. The stockholders and directors of the Brooklyn Baseball Club have today met and unanimously agreed that the necessary steps be taken to draw up the Los Angeles territory. I just hope for all of you an early World Series championship team. I don't know just when we can do it, but we're going to give it an awful good try. So thanks to everybody for being so nice to us. Actually, not everyone in Los Angeles was so nice to the Dodgers. Even after they agreed to come, a referendum was voted upon as to whether the team should be allowed to purchase land at Chavez Ravine and build their own 50,000-seat stadium. It was a difficult fight. I, as one member, am thoroughly convinced that this is a good proposition for the city means much business, means uh, many jobs, and the fact that Mr. O'Malley will build a 10 to $15 million stadium. It was a controversial period, and we had to win our battles, and uh, anything that's good is worth fighting for. Eventually, the battle was won. The referendum was passed. Walter O'Malley would get to fulfill his dream and build a stadium that would soon become a showcase for all of baseball. What's the news I've been waiting to hear? It's wonderful. The Los Angeles is major league in every sense of the word. I'm certain that our citizens join me in expressing appreciation to Walter O'Malley for his show of confidence in Los Angeles and its future. Play ball! Well, hi there, everybody. Welcome to the Southland's first showing of Meet the Dodgers. This is your program so that you may better know the great Major League ball players that this season will be sporting a Los Angeles uniform. You'll find out that the Los Angeles Dodgers are people, much like yourself and your neighborhood. Folks, you can be proud to call neighbors. For the first time in Southern California, I'd like to introduce you to one of the stars of the Los Angeles Dodgers, infielder, outfielder, Junior Gilliam. Junior, I called you an infielder, outfielder. Now, just what are you? Well, I am a second baseman, but I, I will play uh, outfield or infield or any place that uh, I think we'll win. But before the Dodgers would play a game in Los Angeles, tragedy would strike the team when Roy Campanella was paralyzed in a car accident. Although Campy would never play again, he would remain with the team as a consultant and a constant source of inspiration. The spring of 58 was strange for the Dodgers. When it ended, they would head west instead of north, and the B on top of their caps would be replaced by an L.A. Campanella's injury made it even more difficult. It would be tough to replace his ability and leadership, but the job would eventually go to Johnny Roseboro, and he would be asked to shepherd an improved pitching staff led by Don Drysdale. The biggest change of all, however, would come off the field. For most of the Dodgers, Los Angeles was so different from Brooklyn, it might just as well have been in another country. Then there were the West Coast fans. They were sure different than the ones back east. But I remember seeing, being in a dugout, I looked at it one time, seeing uh, two gentlemen, and they were different parts of the, uh, of the stadium, they were barbecuing. I mean, it was picnic to them, you know. And I remember them, they, they, well, that wasn't, that wasn't that bad, you know, I mean, you're, but their backs were to the game. 
Good afternoon, everybody. This is Ben Scully speaking to you from the Los Angeles Coliseum as opening day has finally come to Southern California. Oh, cut on. There's a high fly ball to deep left field. It is gone. The one and two pitch. Fastball got him swinging. The Cinderella team of the National League, and it had to be the Dodgers. Vin Scully was probably as influential as anybody in setting the tone for the popularity of the Dodgers and for the knowledge of the baseball fans here. I think Vin was the uh, the oil in the in the gears. He kept everything going. He brought the people into. He taught people baseball. Whether the fans came to see or be seen, at least they came. More than 78,000 showed up on opening day, and the numbers continued to grow, even as the Dodgers slipped in the standings. The move west was cited as one reason for the team's demise, but another might have been the Coliseum itself. Built for the Olympics in 1932, the layout wasn't all that conducive to baseball. The left field fence at the, the Coliseum was 250 feet, and I didn't care for that, and uh, it was a, a funny year. Most everybody that was with the Dodgers and uh, had been with them and was with them after that through those years, they just kind of liked to forget, but 59, that was a different story. It sure was. For one thing, the Dodgers got used to the oddities the Coliseum presented. Wally Moon, for instance, was the first to take advantage of the short left field wall with high slicing flies that were quickly dubbed moonshots as the Dodgers got off to a surprisingly good start in 59. That, however, took a back seat on the night of May 7th when Roy Campanella was honored in an emotional and stirring ceremony at the Coliseum before 93,000 points of light. Coliseum, perhaps the most beautiful and dramatic moment in the history of sports. Let there be a prayer for every light. And wherever you are, maybe you in silent tribute to Campanella can also say a prayer for his well-being. It would have been a lot to expect the rest of the 59 season to be as dramatic as Campy's night, but in the end it was, with the Dodgers sweeping a two-game playoff with the Braves to win the pennant. In just his second year in Los Angeles, Walter O'Malley had a winner. Of the National League pen, it proudly flies. For this moment we've been waiting. Now LA is celebrating. Everybody's crazy about our guys. We love the Dodgers, the greatest team that ever played the game. We love the Dodgers. The 59 World Series brought even more change for the Dodgers. Their opponents were the Chicago White Sox, not their perennial fall nemesis, the Yankees. But this time, the Dodgers, led by the relief pitching of Larry Sherry, were able to engineer one of the most dramatic turnarounds in baseball history. The year before, they had finished seventh. Now they would capture their first West Coast World Championship by beating the White Sox in six games. It would be the only championship for the Dodgers in the Coliseum. The unusual ballpark had served its purpose. Now, the Dodgers were ready for their new home. The date of Dodger Stadium's formal christening was April 10, 1962, and the city celebrated the opening of its new baseball palace with appropriate flair. Walter O'Malley had good reason to be excited, too. His dream stadium was finally a reality. It was the most gorgeous place to play baseball I'd ever been in. And I used to come to the ballpark at 3 o'clock and sit on the very top, and you're looking straight down at the ball field, and you got all that beautiful scenery out there. I just loved it. I thought it was great. A great stadium should have a great team, and by 1962, that's what general manager Buzzy Bavese had assembled. Unlike Dodger teams in the past, this group didn't have to beat you with the long ball. They could win games with speed and steady defense and a pitching staff that had no equal. 62 would be the first of Sandy Koufax's five straight superhuman years, but even he couldn't match Don Drysdale that year. Drysdale won the league's Cy Young Award by winning 25 games, 
living up to his well-deserved reputation as one of the toughest pitchers in baseball. Drysdale was intimidating. Drysdale gave you a very hard 0 for 4. Koufax gave you a comfortable 0 for 4. Drysdale would come up under your chin, come out here, and he threw from the side. He wouldn't shave on days he was pitching, and he was mean. In 1962, the Dodgers had more than great pitching. Tommy Davis had an exceptional year, leading the major leagues with 230 base hits and a Dodger record 153 RBIs. That number should tell you something about the amount of times people like Maury Wills got on base. Wills was the consummate leadoff hitter, especially in the early 60s. I don't know what's to win ball games. I had a lot of responsibility. So I had to get on base, steal the base, score a run somehow, and then we'd get one and come in and tell Sandy, okay, there's your run. And we win the game one to nothing. Wills not only stole games, he also set a major league record for stealing bases in 62 with 104. Yet almost incredibly, with Wills, Davis, and Drysdale all having career years, the Dodgers still lost the pennant to the Giants in a three-game playoff. The next year, though, Koufax won 25 games, and with the best pitcher in baseball on the mound for the entire year, the Dodgers won the pennant going away. Mr. Koufax was outstanding, Mr. Drysdale was outstanding, Mr. Padres and Mr. Paranowski was outstanding, and Mr. Koufax came back. Nobody could stop us that year. And by the time we hit the Yankees, we were at our peak. Everything was just going well. That might be a bit of an understatement. Undaunted in the den of their ancestors' darkest days, the Los Angeles Dodgers walked all over the Yankees, leashing their phenomenal pitching staff on a disbelieving bunch of New Yorkers to sweep the World Series in four games. They ran across probably four of the finest pitch ball games in the history of World Series play. Drysdale probably pitched the outstanding game in this series when he beat him one to nothing in the third game. And then Sandy come back and beat Whitey Ford two to one in the fourth game. We got the base hit at the right time and we made the everyday routine play in the field. But to sweep him, it'd be almost unheard of. In sweeping the Yanks, the Dodgers had in one way exacted revenge for their Brooklyn brethren, and in another, established their own identity. By now, some of the players were even taking advantage of the Hollywood surroundings, although they were smart enough to keep their day jobs. Another big one Don couldn't finish. <laughs> Will shine for me. Their bum label, now a thing of the past, the Dodgers of the mid-60s were well on their way towards establishing themselves as the class of baseball. 64 might not have gone their way, but led by Willie Davis a year later, the Dodgers were back on top again. Koufax won the second of his three Cy Young Awards by winning 26 games and striking out a record 382 batters. It was another dandy year for, for Sandy. There were spots where, believe it or not, the other team would start to hit him, get some guys on, and start to threaten to take the game away from us. He'd shake himself a little bit and just start blowing people away. He would go to a new level. I remember a seventh inning or so, he was complaining about his arm. His arm wasn't feeling good at all, especially on the curveball. And I said, well, Sam, what do you think we ought to do? And he said, well, let's just go with the heat, babe. And he proceeded to in and out, up and down, in and out, up and down with the fastball for the next three innings. And uh, he blew him away. He struck out the last six hitters he faced when he pitched his perfect game. And, and with all fastballs, to be that strong at the end of seven innings of pitching and to
Get through to the end of a perfect game is, is almost beyond belief. That perfect game came late in the 65 season against the Cubs, the fourth straight year that Sandy had thrown a no-hitter. It's 9.46 p.m. Two and two to Harvey Keene. One strike away. Sandy into his windup. Here's the pitch. Swung out and missed a perfect game. The perfect end to Koufax season came in the World Series against the Minnesota Twins when Sandy would come back to pitch the seventh game with only two days rest. It was a game that would remain scoreless until the sixth inning when Lou Johnson came to bat. To tell you honestly deep down, I knew I was going to do something big in that World Series. I really did. The morning before I hit the home, I called my mom. I said, Ma, I'm going to do something today. Honest. I called a shot. Johnson's homer gave the Dodgers their first run of the inning, and with Koufax on the mound, that was enough. Sandy gave up only three hits, and the Dodgers were world champions again. The Dodgers did get to the series again the next year, but the Baltimore Orioles swept them in four games. And after the season, Dodger fortunes went from bad to worse. Sandy Koufax decided that pitching in constant pain was too much to take. So he abruptly called an end to his brilliant career. I could possibly be a year too soon, and I could possibly not be. Uh... I don't regret one minute of the last 12 years, but I think I would regret one year that was too many. Koufax's departure spelled trouble for the Dodgers, and they knew it. I, I, I didn't know Koufax was going to retire at the end of that year. I didn't know that uh, Tommy Davis would be traded. I didn't know Maury Wills was going to be traded. So I thought that we could come back in 67 and do it again. But the minute I heard Koufax retired, I knew we weren't going to win the pennant the next season. In fact, the Dodgers wouldn't win another pennant until 1974, their longest dry spell since 1941. There was, however, a terrific individual performance during that span. Don Drysdale's record-setting 58 consecutive scoreless inning streak in 1968. The 1-2 pitch to Pena. Swung on a ground ball wide a third. It's Boyer who has the chance. He's done it. A year later, Drysdale would retire, and soon the last links to the great teams of the 60s would follow. First baseman Wes Parker hung up his eight-time gold glove in 1972, and 14-year Dodger Willie Davis would leave in 73, the holder of numerous L.A. team hitting records. Off the field, there was change, too. Walter O'Malley had run the Dodgers since 1950, and in 1970, he turned over the team's presidency to his son, Peter, who has since guided the Dodgers to a remarkable record of seven division titles, five National League pennants, and two world championships in just over 20 years. Continuity has always been a mark of the Dodgers, so when the 70s began, it was natural for them to look to their minor leagues, where Tommy Lasorda and some talented new players were about to emerge. You work together, you pull together, you played like one ball club should, you'd be number one in this league. We learned to be successful on the field by way of great teaching that we had through in the system and the winning attitude. They accepted nothing but winning. Thanks to some of those minor league hopefuls, winning at the major league level began again in 1973. Lasorda, too, had made it to Los Angeles. He was the team's third base coach as the Dodgers finished a close second behind the Cincinnati Reds. But a year later, in 1974, it would be a different story. Relief pitcher Mike Marshall appeared in a record 106 games and won the Cy Young Award while Steve Garvey matured to the point where he was named the National League's most valuable player. The team that general manager Al Campanis had assembled went on to win the National League pennant, although they would eventually lose to the powerful Oakland A's in the World Series. The maturing Dodgers might have expected to go even further the next couple of years, but crippling injuries and playing in the same division as the Big Red Machine ultimately did the Dodgers in. 
It was a time, however, when Don Sutton stood out. The all-time leader in many Dodger pitching categories, won 21 games in 1976, the only time in his 16-year Dodger career he would go over the 20 mark. But that year also marked the end of an era as Walter Alston stepped away from a 23-year career that included four world championships. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Tommy Lasorda. This is the greatest day of my life in baseball. To, to be selected as the manager of an organization that I love so dearly. With Tommy Lasorda as their new manager, the Dodgers powered their way back to the top of the National League. In 1977 alone, Steve Garvey led the way with 33 homers. Reggie Smith followed with 32, while Ron Say and Dusty Baker hit 30, the only time teammates had ever done that. Performances like that certainly kept the fans happy. And in 1978, Dodger Stadium attendance went over the three million mark for the first time in baseball history. Looking back, the 77 and 78 seasons were virtual carbon copies of each other. In both, the Dodgers outlasted the Reds in the West. They then went on to face the Philadelphia Phillies in the playoffs and both times beat them in four games. From there, it was on to play the Yankees in two straight World Series. At the time, the two teams were clearly the class of baseball, and that made for some memorable individual matchups, like Bob Welch against Reggie Jackson in 1978. Unfortunately for the Dodgers, there was one other thing that was similar about the two series. The Yanks took both in six games, and while it was hard to take, there were concrete reasons for the Yankee dominance. I think focus, I think uh, more concentration, more maturity. I think 77, 78, we were still relatively young as far as playing together. After the first two losses, uh, we wanted to get back to the World Series one more time, to face the Yankees one more time. Ultimately, the Dodgers would get the Yankees one more time, but it wouldn't come until 1981. In the interim, Manny Mota would set the all-time Major League record for pinch hits in 1979. And a year later, in 1980, the Dodgers would come from three games back on the season's final weekend to force a playoff with the Houston Astros, although they would eventually lose. Every successful team can point to the one year it came of age, and for this veteran group of Dodgers, 1981 was that year. Ironically, it took a player with much less experience to help them achieve their goal. It's quite possible that in the history of baseball, there has never been another debut quite like Fernando Valenzuela's. Just two months into the season, the 20-year-old screwballing phenomenon from Mexico had eight wins and five shutouts. He had become the most celebrated player in baseball as Fernando Mania swept through L.A. We have a Spanish-speaking population that uh, was just waiting for somebody like that to come along. I think Fernando gave a tremendous amount of pride and respect you know, to the Hispanics of L.A. because they came out every time we pitched. Everywhere you wanted people asked you about Fernando Valenzuela. They wanted to know uh, what he eats for dinner. They wanted to know everything. Uh, what time does he get to the ballpark? What kind of car does he drive? And just being a small part of it is something that I can take with me and cherish, and I know that it was... Um, it's something that I'll always remember is really a terrific time in my life. While one chapter in Dodger history was just beginning in 1981, another was about to come to an end. Although they didn't know it at the time, 81 would be the last of eight straight years the team's celebrated infield of Say and Russell and Lopes and Garvey would play together. It had been a great run. Even with Fernando and the infield, the 1981 Dodgers will best be remembered for their refusal to give in to the pressure of an expanded postseason. In the first series against Houston, we lost the first two ball games. We came back to win our division. Then we went against Montreal. We had our backs up against the wall, down two games to one up there in Montreal. We came back and won two ball games.
Dodger comebacks continued in the World Series when they rallied from two games down against the Yankees to win their fourth World Championship in Los Angeles. It was the kind of team that knew when your backs were against the wall, it was time to start producing. Uh, and it seemed to work with all 25 players at that time who were involved. That's what happened in 1981. When other teams got us down, uh, the 1981 Dodgers were able to come back. Steve Sachs was coming up, Greg Brock was getting ready to come up, Mike Marshall. The old is on its way out, the new is coming in. The reality is setting in that that was it. In 1982, the most prominent of the new Dodgers was second baseman Steve Sachs, who became the fourth Dodger in four years to win the league's Rookie of the Year award. But the Dodgers would ultimately lose their chance at repeating when the San Francisco Giants beat them on the final day of the season with the help of a home run by Joe Morgan. Morgan's homer not only beat the Dodgers, it also poured more fuel on baseball's most intense rivalry. The emotions the Dodger-Giant rivalry generated were pretty much cut and dried. If you loved the Dodgers, you hated the Giants. It was simple, it was deep, and it went way back through the years. The rivalry started between McGraw and Robinson back around 1920, but there was a genuine rivalry between the people in New York and the people in Brooklyn. They didn't care for one another and showed it in any way they could. The rivalry intensified in 1934 after a remark by Giant manager Bill Terry. We had a series in Brooklyn that they beat us at the time, near the end of the season, and one of, the, one of our writers asked him about our Brooklyn club, and he said, Brooklyn club, are they still in the league? The manager here in the National League that made a crack a few years ago about where the Brooklyn club... In the 40s, Leo DeRocher became the central figure on both sides of the rivalry when he was fired by the Dodgers in 1948 and signed with the Giants. Sure ...is welcomed by Secretary Eddie Brannock into the fold of the New York Giants in one of the most surprising moves in baseball history. Arch -giant rival one day. We did not dislike the Giant players per se. We did not like the Giants. I didn't even like the colors orange and black because that was the Giant colors. In fact, when Halloween comes, I, I'm not too happy about Halloween because that's Halloween's colors. When both teams moved west, the rivalry continued, even to the point where Danny Kaye so sung about I it. D. I say D O D O D D O D G D O D G E R S team 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 team. They had to delay the opening of the World Series until the Dodgers and the Giants decided their very personal rivalry in a playoff. And we defy, defy the J I J I N J I N T. J-I-N-T-S, Giants! We would smile at each other, but we didn't mean it at all. We knew we were going to go into one of the biggest battles that we ever had. And then, of course, the Marischal incident really made the Dodger-Giant uh, rivalry that much more uh, explosive. If the Giant-Dodger rivalry isn't as intense as it once was, I hate to see it when it was really intense because it's something that's always been there, and um, believe me, I think it's still going strong. Fighting through a period of transition, the Dodgers, too, continued going strong in the mid-80s. Led by Pedro Guerrero, the Dodgers won a pair of Western Division titles in 1983 and 1985. Although in both championship series, they would wind up losing, the second time to the Cardinals in a frustrating six-game series. In some ways, it was remarkable that the Dodgers were able to keep on winning as their team kept on changing. But a lot of that had to do with two constants, Tommy Lasorda and the Dodger fans. We got great fans. They support the Dodgers year after year after year, and they do it so beautifully. And the only thing I asked of our players in return, if it weren't for them, there wouldn't be any people like us. 
So look up in the stands every once in a while and say, hey, thank you. And the only thing that you can do is give them everything that you got. Play your heart out for them. So when they leave the ballpark, whether you win or lose, they'll say, boy, those guys really put forth all the effort that they have. That's what it's all about. In 1988, the Dodgers certainly paid back their fans. Using a mixture of both recent acquisitions and reliable veterans, new general manager Fred Clare had assembled yet another Dodger team with a never-say-die attitude. Leading the way was Kirk Gibson, who was named the team's first National League Most Valuable Player since 1974, and Cy Young Award winner Oral Hershiser, who in September embarked on a successful mission to pass Don Drysdale's record of 58 consecutive scoreless innings. Hershiser ready, and the one-two pitch is swung on, a fly ball to right. Gonzalez backs up, he's got it, and it, and Hershiser has the record. The Dodgers now are going to go all out to greet him. When you get into a zone like that, it, everything looks like it's just falling into place and it's easy. But really, it's an awful lot of work. During the 59 scoreless innings, I was working probably the hardest I have in my whole life. But a lot of it surrounded around the team that year because we were in the middle of a pennant race and we needed to win every game. The Dodgers took the Western Division and faced the heavily favored New York Mets in the championship series. Throughout, the Dodgers showed some of that never-say-die attitude that had gotten them this far in the first place, especially in Game 4, when trailing by two runs in the top of the ninth, they tied the game on a home run by Mike Socia. And good and ready, Dwight's fastball is hammered to right. Back goes Strawberry, away back, it is gone! And the Dodger dugout is wild in disbelief and joy. Ultimately, the series would go seven games, and that joy would continue thanks to Oral Hershiser. And he looks in now to make what he hopes will be his last pitch. Fastball, got him looking! The Dodgers had beaten the odds once, but now appearing in the 18th World Series in franchise history, they would have to do it again against the powerful Oakland A's. Looking back, although you do need four games to win a series, the Dodgers really put the A's away with a single swing of the bat. Trailing 4-3, two outs, bottom of the ninth of the first game, an injured Kirk Gibson would engineer the single most dramatic swing in the 100-year history of the Dodgers. And look who's coming up. They are afraid I was embarrassing myself. But I was locked in, and I was ready for the competition, and I felt that I was an equal at that time. I, when I put myself on that field with the other people who were healthy, I, I said, okay, I'm equal to you. And when I got to 3-2, I stepped out of the batter's box and made Eckersley step off of the rubber. And I said to myself, what Mel Didier, our, our, one of our scouts, said, if you get him 3-2 in a pressure game, partner, as sure as I'm standing here breathing, he's going to throw you a 3-2 backdoor slider. You look at a time like that, and you see that everybody's problems are erased temporarily. Not one Dodger fan, not one person in L.A. was thinking about any problems. We were all happy. In a year that has been so improbable, the impossible has happened. Got him. They've done it. Like the 1969 Mets, it's the impossible dream revisited. It was a team in a year that has been great for the Dodge organization. It's a, it's, it's a one that everybody, everybody uh, was part of. Everybody should really enjoy and share it and remember it. It was a team of destiny. It was a team that captured the hearts of America. And... Uh, it's something that we'll remember for the rest of our lives. It's been a long journey these 100 years, 
from Washington Park to Ebbets Field to the Coliseum to Dodger Stadium. And the names and the faces and the events come and go, but the legacy remains. A legacy that leaves behind a picture in the mind's eye of a whiter than white jersey with Dodgers across the front in brilliant blue. A legacy of Hall of Famers and most valuable players, of Rookies of the Year and Cy Young Award winners. A legacy of hope and passion and endurance. Now the long journey continues, hopefully for at least another hundred years, and when it does, you can be sure it will do so in the grand Dodger tradition. This has been a Black Canyon production.